I'm, I'm busy enough. We got our thing. I don't want to ever get in the way of doing this. And I don't deliver very timely. So why should yeah. I screw with yeah. my, my schedule? My friend, this is the outtake, right? When you <laughs> confess that you don't deliver timely and all that stuff. Hashtag oh. just saying. I hold you honest on that. You, you, you definitely call me out to our guests. <laughs> I can't hide behind that. Oh. Welcome to the What's Your Baseline podcast. In this show, we talk about our experiences and lessons learned in enterprise architecture and business process management. What's Your Baseline is designed to be for everyone. Newbies who are just getting started with these topics, organizations who want to improve their EA and BPM groups and the value they get from it, as well as practitioners who want to get a different perspective and care about the discipline. Each episode will tackle different key topics, providing context, background, best practices, and stories from the road, inviting you to learn from our challenges and successes, and demonstrating key tools to help you set up your practice and get the most out of it. I'm your host, Roland Wold, and I'm joined today by my co-host, J.M. Erlinson. Hey, J.M., how are you doing today? I'm doing really good, Roland. It's been a long week, I'm going to be honest with you. It took me, uh, my goodness, a lot of custom demos and high level conversations and early morning and late night meetings. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm burning the midnight oil, but I'm burning it to help build a sense of community. And that makes a big difference to me. So, well, I'm a little bit tired today as our recording goes on. I am, my heart might be full. That's the point. My heart is full, mm. even though my brain might be empty. How about you, my friend? Wait, what am I supposed to say? I'm on PTO. <laughs> I, spent, I spent the last three days in, in New River Gorge National Park, which is the, the newest national park here in the United States. Um, and uh, I was walking through the woods. Ooh. Because that's what you do there, you know, on cliffs and, and all that wonderful stuff. And if you don't know, it there's the largest or second largest uh, arc type bridge in the Western Hemisphere there. Whoa. So, yeah, I will put some photos in the show notes so that finally somebody has a reason to, <laughs> to look at the show notes and not just uh, look at the dog pictures that I have to post when the dogs bark. <laughs> it's true. Hey, you introduced me a while ago to a book or a, a series of pictures called Subpar Parks. Yeah. Do you think this park would be a subpar park? It or is. do you consider it, it par park? It is. No, oh, well... Well, I, we have to put it in perspective. So Subpar Park, you know, uh, <laughs> Amber, who's doing those illustrations, she's going on Yelp and she takes the one-star reviews from Yelp and puts them on her illustrations of the, the landmarks in those parks. I yeah. do not agree with that. So, no, it was really nice. You know, it's fall. Everything was, was red and yellow and all that type of stuff. And uh, it was really beautiful. So if you have... Uh, the chance to go there, go there. It's like any other national park. They all have their, their beauty. And this was about four and a half, five hours away from where I live. Uh, we had a nice Airbnb. So it was all. And the best thing is you, you could take dogs with you. Typically, hey. in some national parks, animals are forbidden. And they just say, no, 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 just put them on a, on a physical leash. And then I had to be educated what the difference between a physical leash and uh, a non-physical leash is. You know, those, those electro colors which I absolutely despise. Oof. They're, they're I... sold as whatever wireless leashes here, which doesn't make sense at all. So you just had to have your puppy on, on a leash and then everything's good. Wow. I, I, I got to be honest with you. I don't know a lot about leashes or dogs anymore. I used to, I grew up with a dog in the house, really nice dog. I, I quite enjoyed having a dog as a child, but ever since then I've had cats Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't even have a collar on our cat. She's an indoor cat. She is our our baby. Her name is Meow Meow. Occasionally, you'll hear her speak on the podcast, although I do have an AI-powered uh, noise reduction system in place, so hopefully you don't get that. But if her bowl is empty, she will ask for more food, <laughs> regardless well, of what I'm doing. So no dogs, just cats. Well, what, what am I supposed to say? You know, I don't have an AI-powered thing. I just... <laughs> <laughs> have to post puppy pictures if the dog is barking. And by the way, if you haven't noticed it, we have a second dog now. We have another puppy. So um, now I got the barking in stereo. But I don't hey. think, Jam, that this is the topic of our show today, is it? It isn't. And I, I'm really glad we get a chance to chat with our audience. Hey, folks, thanks for coming on a, on a little ride with us. Today, it is 
roll and deny. No guest, just our own brain thoughts and methodologies we've come up with. And we like to sort of intersperse these with the guests along our season to give you a little bit more flavor as to what we're thinking, what we're seeing in the marketplace. And today, our conversation is something that I literally had earlier today, a conversation about, which is all about an approach to process mining analysis. Now, I get this question all the time, where do I start? What do I look for? What am I going to need? And man, if I could get everyone, <laughs> all of my clients to listen to this podcast, um, but also just to, to read the, the show notes of this as well. And once again, a huge pitch for whatsyourbaseline.com for the show notes on this. You're going to get a few different graphics that will help you to understand exactly how this breaks down. But over the course of the next, you know, 50 minutes or so, we're going to get a chance to walk you through what we think is important when we're looking at analyzing process mining data and trying to do something about it. Because I think, Roland, you and I agree, one of the biggest hurdles for process mining focused projects is getting from the data to actionable process re-engineering. Oh, that's, 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 there's two steps in between that you just missed. You know? I know. So, so yeah, but I, I think the biggest challenge that that I see is um, vendors, independent of of who you look at, they try yeah. to sell your software and they say, "Oh, yeah, just dump your data in there and da da, here it is, and look which fancy dashboards you can build and what wonderful metrics we calculate and and all that type of stuff." And I just think this is not enough. You know, I think uh, when you when you look at it, I don't want to spill the beans here uh, when you look at what the, the six sigma folks do and they use things like cypoc diagrams and and fishbone diagrams and all that type of stuff yeah i think this is which helps you know what is the approach and we had an episode about lean and process mining yes. a couple of months ago and i think the show today uh is in the same vein but it also goes a little bit more hands-on into the depth of how to yeah. do a process analysis using your process mining tool. Well, this is supposed to be a bit of a guide, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And for that, uh, if if after your announcement, the retention to this show hasn't dropped immensely, um, we will have, we will talk about three things. The first thing is we're going to talk about the approach to a process mining project. Yes. Right. And 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 we've developed here a six-step step process, I'm pretty sure, you will find similar things elsewhere as well, uh, but I will also put a graphic in the show notes. Um, we talk about that, and then we talk about a high-level process mining analysis and then a more detailed process mining analysis. And the idea is obviously to give you the framework, the structure, you know, the skeleton of, to do, of doing your process mining analysis, um, which you will have to adapt to your process in scope. I agree. And so let, let's let's walk through the very high level thing. And once again, as Roland said, we, we aren't really saying this is novel or unique, but rather from all the different things we've done, we've synthesized kind of what the core pieces of a process mining project needs. And one of the things we, we are, are going to urge you today, and I once again, I literally just had this conversation, is to not skip particularly steps, step with step one. And it's something we talk about in every in every show. We always talk about it. the thing, the first thing you're ready to forget is strategy and objective. And let's walk through it because we're going to go at a very high level by starting with what are your objectives for this process mining initiative? I get questions from my, my, my like prospects all the time. Can I just give you data and you tell me what's wrong? And we talked about this on the podcast before. I want to mm -hmm. reinforce that right now. Data does not necessarily tell a story on its own. In fact, quite often, if it were to tell a story, that story would be very confusing because you would lose the narrative thread. You don't know who the characters are. You don't know what characteristics are important. You're going to struggle to actually make sense of it without understanding what you want to get out of it first. Yeah, and and I think it's, it's uh, worth reminding the audience uh, about the sequence. And I it just said a couple of minutes ago, you missed... Uh, two steps in between because what you feed the beast with is data it's raw data you know it's from a table you know this is my purchase yeah. orders or this is my incident list or whatever right and um what the process mining tools do 
they add context. Right, and we will talk about the context, whatever that means, a little bit later. So they transform the data into information, right? But the process mining analysis is actually what creates knowledge, right? So that you say, okay, I right. see certain patterns, I see things, spikes, whatever, right? And, and that knowledge is actually the interesting thing, right? Because from that knowledge, you will then derive opportunities. And, and typically... Like JM said, I don't know if you said it in, in this uh, clear terms, we typically follow a six-step process. And the first step is uh, define your strategy, right, in lack of a, of a better word. So uh, I think it's two parts of it, and there's different people involved in those conversations. And the first part in my mind is you have to define your objectives. Right. Why do I do this? Why do I want to do process mining? Right. And JM to your question. Yeah. It, do I just dump in data and I get an answer? Yeah, you get an answer. It might not be a useful answer. Right. So what you want is you want to um to compare it. If you go to your to your doctor and you say, Oh, I don't feel well. Can you check me out? You know, yes, he can do something. But it's much better if you tell him the symptoms. You know, you got a cough or your left knee hurts or whatever it is. And it's the same with process mining. You know, you need to be able to articulate, hey, I have a, a process. And the process just doesn't work the way how I think it should work. Right? Yes. Yeah. Typically, you look at four different things and and. I don't know if I can get all C's together. So the, the first one is um, cost in no specific order, you know, cost. Yeah. Oh, it's too pricey, you know. Uh, the, the second one is customer experience, and we spoke about customer experience a yes, lot, we did. right? The, the third one, and now I'm losing my C's, is uh, obviously the throughput, you know, how many things can I push through the process, you know? Uh, and the fourth one is obviously the velocity that you have, you know, how fast mm -hmm. can I put it through? And, and that reminds you obviously on resources and all that wonderful stuff that goes with it. Right. I, so I might it, add a five C, a fifth C to that one, which is compliance. Yeah. And we'll talk about that as well. Because yes. compliance yeah. adds risk. Yeah. Cause a lot of uh, my customers have regulatory obligations um, or they have internal audits or they have internal best practices or their ISO or whatever, like, and negative outcomes or early breaks in the process or risky activities being found within the process that were not expected carry with them a substantial, um, both like a liability risk, a reputational risk, a regulatory risk. Like there's a ton of stuff that is is yeah. going to come out from that. So agreed, agreed. Yeah, the, the, the old fifth C that gets you. <laughs> but this is this is actually this is actually something that's independent of the single analysis that you want to do. Yes, you think about it. You need to take a step back and say. What does good look like for me? You know, how do I yeah. evaluate a process, right? The fastest, the cheapest, the best resource, you, whatever, right? And, and I think this is something before you get started with a process mining project is to think about what is your measuring stick on, yes. on this. So what you typically see here is obviously a conversation between um, the business stakeholders, you know, your, your process analyst and your risk specialist, because I'm I'm absolutely on your page. You know, you need to be risk and compliant, compliant, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, once you have that, JM, what's the second step in that that strategy phase? Aha, nice prompt for me. Um, now we're talking about process. Um, you want to identify your process and be able to understand what you're actually your data is actually pertaining to. I think about this a lot as the, as the as setting the data in the context of the business bef beforehand. So you're preparing the data to sit into what it what it refers to. Oftentimes we see that just raw data with no context of what it functions for will lead you down weird, unusual, unhelpful paths. You won't know why this data matters to the business and what it does, how it fits into the business operation. So what process am I actually measuring? And do I have existing standards? Do I have existing templates that I can go off identification of, of execution patterns? So mm -hmm. if it's an order to cash or it's a procure to pay, there, there are like best practices that exist for that and identifying that process. And also if you have it, uh, going, starting the, the conversation with the rest of the business about whether or not you have a documentation, not, not yet, but whether or not there's existing documentation, either in like system uh, implementation 
the documentation that goes along with it, or whether or not you've actually have a, a process excellence team that's been working on something like this. So that'll come up later. But the, what process am I talking about is going to start setting the context for you. Yeah. And, and what I tell clients at that stage in the game is to say, you need to have a napkin level understanding of your process. Yeah. Because you need to understand what is what are the systems where you want to take information from, right? Which brings us actually to the second step in, in our six-step methodology, if you will. It's the second we big need, step. Yeah, we need to identify the system. So while we do the process identification, we're going to have an engineer, right? The IT person and a data scientist who understands what the data structures are and all those wonderful things. But then you go into the extraction as a second step, the extraction of the system logs, which is typically three steps. One is you identify the systems. Every step in process mining, little refresher needs to have somewhere a table that you pull data from. Uh, you might create optionally, which I would not recommend for your very first process uh, or, or project, you might create live system connections because yeah. it adds quite a lot of complexity to it. And then you extract the data. So basically you get a bunch of tables from whatever your Salesforce, your SAP, your whatever you have. So what do you do next then, JM, in step three? Well, I, I mean, the you're in step three, and this is where we get into a little bit of overlap because step two and step three are sort of codependent. Because step three, you're creating a data model and validating it. Part of that, creating a data model, is understanding what KPIs you're going to use to help tie into your objectives and where those KPIs are going to come from. So what, what data am I going to have to have in order to be able to identify the scores on my KPIs, right? And then where can I get that data from? So what sources contain the data that I'm going to use to score the KPIs? And as a result, what systems do I need to connect into to get that data? So is codependence from these two things? Because if you start just with getting the logs and then reverse engineering what those logs should say, you miss out a little bit. If you start saying, I'd love to know the following things, but you have no knowledge of what's actually in your systems, you're proposing an Nirvana state that does not exist. So you need to work a little bit hand in hand. So I would call two and three, once again, codependent, but in terms of like actual operations, that is the next piece of the puzzle. It is creating that data model and validating that data. Of course, your data is not going to be sparkly clean in your first run. There's going to be a lot of things to be to be sort of concerned about, know in advance, and have a plan to address. Roland, I'm sure you've seen the same thing as I about garbage data, whether or not you've got format mm -hmm. and structure issues, whether or not you have overlap or duplication or missing and mismatched formatting of records, whether or not you're pulling data from multiple sources and you need to validate that they have an interlock key, that sort of dovetailing that allows you to see them as part of an end-to-end, -end. whether or not your data sets are too large for your platforms, you need to split them and then union them, how are you going to transform that data from formats that don't make any sense to something that does make sense by, for instance, bringing in an activity name key. Roland, you and I, years ago, worked on a project, you remember it well, mm -hmm. where all of our activities were simply long codes that were previous step, subsequent step, and we had to key that in with what the business activity means. That's part of your data validation so that you can get a final set that actually makes sense before you go to your next phase. So that is, yeah, that is very interesting because I, I just created uh, the outline, you know, a, a big mind map as JM, you know, I'm a big fan of mind maps. You are. Um, and I just created a, a big fat mind map about uh, data modeling. And yes. I know tools, vendors have different tools and different approaches to it. Um, in, in the company that I work for, we're of the opinion you should not have to code, you know, no matter yeah. how fancy your your vendor labels the SQL flavor of the day that they have, because that might be a step too much. So, uh, but to look at that approach, and that might actually validate another episode. It's Just true. It's true. About that. Oh, oh, um, also, I think we disagree a little bit. I, I do like no code options, but I I also, as somebody who is not a coder, which is might be surprising to hear this, as somebody who's not a coder, I do appreciate the ability 
to dip very lightly into code to get exactly what I oh, want. Oh, you can do that in in visual tools as well. But anyways, sure. I don't want to I don't want to go down that route. <laughs> what I where I want to go is um, it's basically an approach that you need to apply to your data modeling as well. The first mm-hmm. thing is just like you said, it's data cleansing. It's all yeah. those things that you just mentioned, you know. Um, but then the second thing is create an initial activity log. Yeah. Right? So after you after you filtered out or or cleaned up the missing data and whatever, all that wonderful stuff, then get the bare bones right. And the bare bones are timestamps, activity names, and case IDs. That's it. Right? And yeah. dump it in your process mining tool and see if the process mining tool spits out a, a, a graph, you know, yeah. hooray, milestone one, you know. And then uh, in multiple iterations, and think about a, a an onion, you know, then you say, oh, yeah, what else do I have to add? And this is where your KPIs come in, you know, your hypothesis that you have in your strategy and say, oh, yeah, I want to see this thing. And it uh, manifests itself as this SLA or as this whatever metric that you want to calculate. Because then you go and you enhance your data model, your activity log with additional data. You know, you calculate, oh, degree of automation. You know, is there something like a system user in there versus a real person? Yeah. Well, you need to have a column that says 100 if you want to have a percentage. And the ones that have no system things might have a zero in there, right? So you go through your list. That's a third step. You go through the list of your hypothesis and your KPIs that you want to see that uh, talk to that, to those hypotheses, uh, and then add more columns, basically, in a nutshell, to your data model. So it's like peeling an onion. Yeah, like yeah, peeling yeah. an onion, you know? And that's why it's so important to have this. And then the next step that you do is, which everybody's scared of, you go to your client and say, oh, poke a hole in it, or in business terms, you validate the data, right? Because what uh, people don't like to see, which they will see with process mining, when you come to the analysis which we'll talk about in a few minutes, they might see some things that they don't want to see. And what's the easiest uh, answer that you then hear? That's not my data. Yeah, your data is wrong. You know, yeah, you made a mistake, right? Mm-hmm. So you want to have the, the, the data validation and say, okay, like uh, Morpheus in the Matrix, you know, bring it to me, you know, and <laughs> and then you compare whatever your data set and you look at certain cases in your ERP system or whatever your, your source is. You say, is it reflected correctly in the process mining tool? This case, can we can we see all the steps that you have? Great, you know, because then you, you cut off that argument that your data is wrong. Well, I, like one of our previous episodes, actually, I think our last episode, one of my favorite things is when, is when a customer says, that's not our data. Mm-hmm. It tells me that I'm about to blow their mind. Uh, in, in a good or negative way, yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> when it is their data, suddenly they're compelled to act because it shakes their foundation of understanding. Yeah. And it means when they see something that they didn't expect, they're about to have an opportunity to change, <clears throat> an opportunity to address that previously was obscured to them that may have led to bad business outcomes they can meaningfully affect with this specific analysis today. I love it. I'll take it anytime. Yeah, and 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 in that third step, we have another loop, right? As we had the loop between step two, the system logs and the data modeling, we have now a, another loop within the data modeling itself because if your validation fails, you have to go and and uh, change your data model, you know, um, which sometimes might be tricky because you might have some assumptions being built in that the client might not agree with. But true. moving on, there's one more step that I would call a preparation step, a step four, which is creating a reference model. Uh, right. Remember when I said in step one, uh, you need a understanding of your process on a quote unquote napkin level yeah. uh, understanding. This is now where you take this and you actually create a BPMN diagram. And it's you, true. You say, what are your steps and who's doing it and all that type of stuff, because you will need it in your analysis a little bit later. One thing I might say about this, and this is where we, we might want to wax a little poetic on it. I often find using process mining a, a good tool to establish a norm for 
creating a reference model for people who don't have any reference mm-hmm. model today. It's a bit of like you're kind of you're kind of both cooking the chicken at the end, the egg at the same time, which sounds like a weird thing to do. It is. Because you're using process mining to generate a log or to generate a, a visualization that turns into a model that becomes your reference for the log which you generated the model from, which is, a once again, it's a little bit of a circle. However, I know that a lot of organizations are not in great positions to generate a reliable standard process for as part of their analysis because of their level of maturity or documentation, or simply they want to try and quote unquote move fast. So yes, creating a reference model is really important. Get your BPMNs ready to go, but don't be scared if you need to use your process mining tool to generate that for you. It's not ideal, but it is a really great way to start the conversation. One thing I use very heavily for that is understanding the different variants going through them. And if there, if there's a few that are much more common, validating with stakeholders, is this okay? Is this an okay practice? And they go, yeah, this one looks great. Ah, I hate this one. I don't want it. So I knock that one out. Oh, this one looks great. Oh, this one I don't like. So the, the one, three, and five are going to become our standard that we're going to put as a model that we can now compare with. Don't spoil it, Jim. We're going to talk about that <laughs> stuff a little bit later. All no, right, just so- to say you can. You can validate it like that. So we're getting we're getting to the end, you know. We're getting to step five. You know, I know. step five is actually the meat of this this episode here. You know, we're talking about what is your process analysis, right? Yes. And and we will talk about the as nauseum. So I don't want to go too much into detail. Analyze problem. But you obviously have some findings afterwards, right? So you do some presentation, and and one thing that I typically like to do is is short projects. You know, not the half year or full year or whatever, but half, whatever, four or five weeks and do many, Mm -hmm. many, many of those. And obviously, as one part of it, you create some presentation in parallel. Yeah. Right. And then mirror it back to the client and they say, oh, I don't understand. Can we drill it down further? You know, and then you might have another loop within that analysis that might lead to a loop to your data modeling if you don't have the data in there which might lead to a loop to the IT systems if you want to have more. And if this sounds complicated in four to five weeks, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And (laughs) therefore, I typically recommend to say, okay, you got two iterations. You know, you got your initial thing, right? Initial extraction, create an initial data model, create an initial analysis, and do two iterations on top of it. Because anything else, I think, is too much for that short period of time. And that will lead us to step six. And step six also sort of has a loop back, right? Which is finding opportunities for improvement and then leading to execution of those opportunities. So so actually realizing some of those changes and then using process mining to check back on whether or not those, those improvements are effective and spurring the next project. Maybe, hey, listen, iterative analysis, iterative improvement, right? But this is the good news is this is outside of the scope of this episode. Because <laughs> we needed to end, we end point in our yes. uh, end to end process that we go through. But you're absolutely right. Obviously, you want to use process mining for continuous monitoring after you did an implementation, after you implemented your change. And continuous implementation. You know, when you think about CI CD style, like delivery of process improvement, right? Mm-hmm. This is a great way to do it. So we've got our six steps. And I want to take a break because now you now people are our brains are melting on the define strategy, extract system logs, create event logs, create or or ingest or or harmonize a reference model, analyze your processes and find improvement opportunities. These are really good steps. Think about yourselves. Have you done all of these steps in your process mining projects in the past? If not, which ones did you miss? Which ones did we miss? Take a stock of what you've done. Think about that while you listen to a little bit of music, and we're going to come back with our next section, a high-level process mining analysis. And be loved in return. And welcome back. Um, now that we've spoken about the six-step process, a little bit longer than I thought, we just have about 20,000 bullet points that we want to 
go through within the next 30 minutes to talk about the individual analysis that you could do. But don't be afraid. Uh, we do put a couple of resources uh, in the show notes. So you find a graphic of oh, yeah. the six-step process that we have. Um, I also, full disclosure, will put a couple of links to our university offering um, uh, in there where you can reread in our free of charge training material what JM and I will talk about within the next couple of minutes, hours, days. Oh, months, yeah. Um, well, about all a, every vendor has has a, uh, a, a way of teaching you about how they do it in their platforms. But remember that the practice that they're espousing happens to use their software but like this podcast and our, and our tool agnostic nature, really it's about educating yourselves on how to approach this, which is why oh, we yeah. do these sorts of things. I created that training with exactly that idea behind to say, yeah, it doesn't matter what you look at. It's more important how you look at things. Mm -hmm. But let's get started, Jim. And, and maybe I take the first, the first bullet here that we have on our little cheat sheet. One is, I think you need, and, and we alluded a little bit to it, you need to have a holistic approach to process mining, right? The yes. first thing is we mentioned it, you need to have your hypothesis, right? Don't yep. go in there blue eyed and say, oh, here's my data, go fix it, you know, give me, give me smart ideas. That doesn't work, right? And uh, the other myth that people might have uh, in their mind is you should talk with people. Right, so the data doesn't give you everything. The data doesn't give you the necessary context. So consult your SMEs. Consult the guys who do the process for the last twenty years. They have seen a thing or two. You know, they know how it goes. They know where the skeletons are buried. <laughs> and then the the third thing that I would uh, highly recommend: be very transparent. Right, no matter what you do, communicate, communicate, communicate. Capture and, and share your results freely. Because the more people look at it, the more input you get, the better your analysis result will be. And then maybe the last last thing that you might want to think about, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, look at what those lean guys do. You know, I love fishbone diagrams. You know, ask you the whys until you're at the bottom of it and, and you find the answer. You know, um, I can put a, a example of fishbone in the show notes as well. But the idea is to say, okay, you have your hypothesis and and every hypothesis becomes a scale in the in the fishbone. And you try to drill down and find the root cause of the problem that you have. And most likely, it's not the first obvious thing that you see in your data. Yeah, and that, that's a good holistic approach that gives you sort of a guideline of where to go. But the truth is that the first thing you're usually going to see when you do any sort of process mining analysis is you're going to get a picture of what the process was. Some rough stats that don't really give you a lot of excellent information on where the problem might be, but they might highlight that there is a problem. So a good example is you see like uh, how many cases do we have? How many events do you see? How long did things take? Um, how wh When were these cases executed? So you can check back, hey, is my data set appropriate for what I'm looking to understand? A good example of where that either falls off or is actually well aligned is if you're looking to see a, de a delta in performance in two different sets of data. So you have a data before a transformation, data after a transformation, you need to make sure you see the distribution of cases over those times. And if those things like transformations had an effect on your averages, or your variance, or or your different KPIs at a very coarse level for the whole process. So usually we don't get into individual step performance here, or we don't get into individual like measures and dimensions. They're just giving you an overall picture of what things are, and it once again that's your first level of validation. I've got the right stuff in yeah. here. Yeah, and there's there's some and obviously the, the different vendors do it differently. You know, one metric that I like is if you have when you think about the lean stuff again, the efficiency, you know, the time that the steps actually take versus the whole cycle time of the whole yeah. case, you know. Processing versus throughput time, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you see something like two percent. That is a nice indication that something can definitely be improved, you know, uh, or <laughs> things like uh, the, the number of variants. And, and I just did a process mining project uh, with a bank and they gave us a relatively small data set, 256 cases, you know, mm -hmm. um, and we had 256 variations. In that. <laughs> that, can I, can I give you a different horror story, Roland? 
I just I just did a process mining a uh, little test right away with um, 1.2 million cases. And there were three hundred thousand variants. Ooh, yeah. Well, that's not. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Oh wow. But that that also gives me some idea. So this is what where I can start to say for iterative analysis. I'm gonna have to start grouping variants. I'm gonna have to say, okay, these things are roughly equivalent, or mm-hmm. I'm gonna have to. It's not meaningfully different. These two or three or five or ten or a hundred ways that are very similar to each other. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, it's also interesting when you when you come back to the to the data model. So in in um, that bank's case, they had a, a weird data set. They had whatever in in that whole process like thirty process steps. Yeah. But then each process step had another action behind it, right? So from from recommend to uh, whatever consult to approve to archive to whatever, right? So right. actually, when you concatenated it in your data model, you got one hundred and ten steps. Right, oh. and then <clears throat> you obviously went through, and you have way more whatever variations in there. But I, I'm I'm with you. We're, we're going to talk about variant distribution uh, a little bit because this is just the first thing you see, uh, which I would assume you see in every process mining software. We get you an do. overview, yeah. right, with the idea that you get that first glimpse and say, oh, does the process look good, or or something completely out of whack, you know, and um, yeah, you need to do more. But well, we haven't actually talked about the, how the process looks because right now this is just the that's the next overview. Thing. Yeah, that's tell the next me about thing, the know? pretty pictures, my friend. Yeah, so the, the, <laughs> the next thing is is what I would call process discovery, and and this is obviously the fancy name for the base tool uh, feature that that a process mining tool has to create a process graph. You know, yeah. <clears throat> to show uh, the spaghetti diagram. Of all the things that go through, and this is the the oh shikes moment that that clients have, you know, to say mm-hmm. really that's not my process, that's not my data. Yep, you must have, uh, you must be dreaming and whatnot, you know. Um, typically, those uh, graphs will have additional information. Sure. Right. So dimensions and metrics, just to have it set to to, to define it. Dimensions obviously will be things like. Uh, nominative things like regions or uh, yeah. product lines or whatever, you know, things, while metrics would be numbers, right? But that might yeah. be a little bit too too specific. But you would look at those things and you would see more information uh, to that process. Yeah, I, I think of things, uh, the dimensions I use as filter characteristics that allow me mm-hmm. to segment my population. Yes. And measures are things I use for calculation <laughs> that allow me to give a score on some sort of outcome. D- different definitions, slightly different approach, but uh, goes into the same direction. And I don't yeah. want to go into too many details. This is, at the end of the day, it's more stuff. <laughs> and, and I agree with you, it's more than that helps you to filter things. Right. Exactly. And Honestly. so now, now we start to like take a look at um, the process patterns. So patterns are really useful to understand. What are you? What are our start events? So are we mm-hmm. starting in the right place each time? Do we have, let's just say, a good examples like Maverick buying for a procure to pay process? Do we have over the wrong place this process is, is kicking off? We also find end events. So cases that are still in progress. So we've got a truncated data set, or unusual, or unexpected ends of a process, early exits, fail conditions, rejects or returns. These are patterns that are interesting to see in terms of the flow itself. But this can have multiple assumptions. When you see, for example, multiple start events, right? Yeah. It could be perfectly, stick with that procure to pay thing, perfectly legitimate that your your process starts with create PO because you have automatic replenishment, you know, or touchless replenishment. Perfectly fine, you know. But then... You might ask your question, if they start with whatever, goods receipt or receive an invoice or whatever, you should check your data set, mm-hmm. right? Is, did you make the cut at some point in time? And those cases actually should have been filtered out because you don't have the complete end-to-end. So you basically go back, take your case that starts with, in, in my example, with a goods receipt or an invoice. And go into your ERP system and see if if you have a cutoff date of whatever, January 1, 23, if there are steps that happened before. Because then you have to filter out those cases. Yeah. I'll say that there's a, um, there's a, a tremendous amount of backstage um, and onstage 
that I go through in process mining analyses, and I th- I'm sure you'll have the same sort of thing iterative as you refine mm-hmm. your analysis, you'll look on stage. Think of this like sort of the, the process mining visualization, process discovery, and graphs as what you see as a result of the data processing you've done. You'll notice issues, and then you'll want to go backstage and do some work in the wings, do some work you know, to, to move some rigging around so that the process transformations result in the right data being presented to you and then go back on stage. Hey, does, does this look good now? And you're going to do this iteration because, you know, you can do a certain amount of data cleansing on in preparation, but until you truly see it, there are some things you will likely miss and that's okay. Don't be scared. Just to give you another example, I I created a data model the other day and uh, I calculated the uh, duration between uh, the first and the last activity in it. And yep. I got negative results. That happens all the time to me. Right? So, oh, I know that so feeling. it's like, what? You know? And for some of them, I could explain it because it was uh, subtracting the calendar week from another one. So if you yeah. just subtract one minus 53 of the previous, you get minus 52, blah, blah. So so those of them were obviously calculation errors in the data model, but others were were truly errors, you know, where the, the last step had an earlier timestamp than the presumably first one, right? And then you have to think about, okay, what do I do with it? You know, do I reject it? Do I filter it out? Or is that an observation that I have, you know, and, and that could trigger a little bit more. Absolutely. And now we're going to try and do something with additional information. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch more that you can get out from this. We've talked at a very high level, but let's talk about information on individual cases or even individual activities within a case. So we take a look at are our cases or certain cases and variants performing differently than others? Do we see a lot of wait or wait times or long processing times, high manual task or or manual, manual work allocation? Do we have opportunities for automation as a result of low efficiency we discover in a particular work pattern or in a particular region, like a dimension that we can filter out on? Mm -hmm. We can also look at things like the, the, a a single step that's taking a long time that's associated to a resource. Are we creating, I would say, cost bottlenecks as a result of tasks that we think are important and we're assigning very expensive people to them and they take a long time where automation could change that? So... Are, is this is this creating an opportunity for automation because of our previous process decisions that we've tacitly made? I, one of our guests said something that that um, stuck with me, which is that automation is just tacit um, standardization. Well, maybe yeah. you've standardized on the wrong way of doing things. I think that the interesting thing here is don't take the single KPI uh, as the the master, if you will. They no. all need some context. So, for example, <clears throat> when you said it. Uh, you talk about certain variant, right, versus the overall process. Well, you actually would look for that efficiency, right? If your tool doesn't calculate it automatically, I highly recommend to calculate it as a standard thing um, in every uh, each of your process because if you have this, it could be a training issue, you know, if you have low efficiency. Um, or if you have, uh, you look at the average duration, you always want to look at the frequency, yeah. Right. If you have a high duration, but it happens once in a century, who gives a whatever, right? But if you have yeah. duration and it's on that high frequency path, well, you might have an issue at hand. So I think you want to look at, at those correlations, you know, high cycle time plus efficiency or duration plus frequencies in there, right? And then if needed, drill further down, you know, use task mining, use observations, you know, um, don't want to put some Japanese words in there, what the lean guys do, you know, just watch what people do, right, and and try to find the, the reason. The, the next thing that you might want to see, and I haven't seen that in a lot of process mining tools, is the degree of parallel work or concurrency, right, which is a little bit interesting to calculate, um, but that could be another KPI that you look at it. And in some situations, that could be very, very desirable, right? To say, okay, I'm, I'm able to split uh, the work over multiple people and thereby increase my throughput time, 
right? Because they yeah. don't have to wait and whatnot. So if your tool doesn't do that, calculate it manually if you can, you know, as part of your data model to, to see this. Yeah, and it also talks to things like uh, other, so other sorts of um, flow patterns that are interesting to, to analyze. Um, one, of course, is rework, right? Loops, um, unplanned, uh, unplanned like loopbacks into early stages of the process, the repeating of a single step. Uh, Roland, I think you and I worked with a, a situation where there was a certain status in, in an automation tool that had over and over again, it would return to that status. And it was, you saw like it would move from person mm -hmm. to person as everyone sort of shuffled the task to the next person. Well, that's not just rework, that's unplanned rework, unplanned or, or unplanned delegation that wasn't work at all. So you can see these weird patterns of flow behavior and you can understand I think what you talked about before, which is what are the costs times how often does it happen, which I, I would say is the, the impact or the severity to the business of these particular patterns of behavior. And you can say, hey, this is something that's actually worth addressing because it's causing a significant slowdown to our end customer. And so rework loops, unplanned flow patterns are interesting. And that does tie, tie into frequency, right? Yeah. This ties into frequency and time because those are things you're going to get generally with, with process mining because you have a certain number of cases, that's frequency, mm -hmm. oh, with timestamps over time. And those cases are going to give you a sense of what was the difference between two timestamps. That's going to give you our throughput. And what was it or or processing time if it's within a single step? And so all these all these things give you frequency, time, and in in some cases when you start to do with rework and loops, patterns of of behavior that you don't want to see. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I'm with you. And then you obviously have also the the challenge if you go into more details on this. Um, you have the chance to say, okay, do I stop here, right? Or yeah. is, for example, a rework, do you, do you just say, okay, yeah, we see there's rework there. Okay, case closed. Or is that your trigger to do more analysis? Oh, in which region does that happen? Or which user is is there? You know, whatever whatever it is. And, and I know we sound very abstract here sure. um, about this. Yep. But but he would so just, uh, just also talk about that one more thing is that, you know, I, <laughs> Roland and I in the background have this little sort of shared document where we're reading through. He just typed the word business into this document because I, I, I think I, I know what you mean, but I want to talk about it because I love it a lot, is that you are the arbiter of your business. You know why things happen. Your process finding tool doesn't. It's dumb. It's just uh -huh. a data processing tool. Yeah, some have AI in them and some have ML capabilities and there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. But ultimately you know your business. And so when a pattern of behavior appears in your process mining data set, you and your subject matter experts need to look at it and say, why do we think this is happening? Is this expected behavior? Is this acceptable behavior? And what do we want to do about it? That's a yeah. business decision. Agreed. All process mining does is allows you to have a really good visibility into what you couldn't previously see. Yeah, and then, and then we have three more things before we, we go yes. to the second break. And I, I go through it a little bit faster because, <laughs> as you might have noticed, it's the, the whole game in process mining is iterations, right? So it's yeah. a little bit redundant, a little bit iterative. But to, to say it in, in a quick succession. So frequency analysis, we spoke yep. about this, right? You want to look at and, and look at the different activities, the different start activities, for example, that we spoke about. You want to look at percentages, you know, how many percent go here, uh, versus total numbers, right, that you yep. have in your flow, right? Uh, does your process end prematurely or as undesirable activities, you know, and that can trigger more uh, investigation on a case level. And then we spoke about the rework. The, the second thing is is time analysis, right? Yeah. Uh, we briefly spoke about it. Typically, you have, or ideally, you have two timestamps so that you can calculate the task duration and how long it does it take from step A to step B, you know, the, the handover. There are ways, and maybe we really should do the data modeling episode, JM. <laughs> there are ways where you can calculate an, an end date uh, if your data set allows this. That obviously has a couple of, of uh, implications, and I created for one client a nice two-by-two two matrix and explained all that stuff, what I did there. Um, but maybe more interesting when you look at time analysis is, uh, which I also had in a, in a current project, business days versus calendar days. Out of the box, uh, process mining to calculate calendar days, but that might not be what you want. 
Yep. When you think about SLAs, you know, how fast do you have to react to a customer complaint and whatnot? Those are typically measured in business days. So another iteration where you go back to your data model, and I'm happy to talk about how I did this, <laughs> solve this um, where you calculate basically the number of weeks, right? Yep. And then, you know, oh, if, if uh, you have calendar week A minus calendar week B and the number is larger than one, then there must be a weekend in between. So you take that number, multiply it by two, the, no, the number of dates, weekend days that you have to subtract from the blah 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 so this yeah. is this is all the fun that you have and obviously the, the time analysis can can identify your automation candidates and just a quick pitch that's where something like a like a little bit of coding uh-huh might be useful you don't on have that to side. We're, we're using i know visual tool, i know but which it, i really yeah, love you, know? well, well, you can do that here too we disagree but we, we love each other nonetheless well either way so <laughs> the last thing that i have I is is bottleneck analysis and yes if you have a graph, a 2D graph, yes, you can see this. But what I really notice is humans are visual people, right? Uh, and and hopefully your tool gives you a good visualization, you know, little ants that walk through a process and then you see how the ants pile up on a certain step and all these things over time. Uh, that is something that makes it real for stakeholders and makes it real for analysts to say, oh, look, this step is is where it, where it breaks, you know, and this is why we have uh, the, 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 whatever, hold up here, right? The, the tools do it differently. Some highlight the steps, some show little ants and whatnot, but I think a visualization is very helpful. Yeah, play, like playback can be yeah. a useful tool to tell to, as a storytelling tool. Um, it depends on what you want, um, want to show people. Um, I have seen a few different ways of visualizing playback. It's, it's good. And maybe, Maybe it's useful for you too. Maybe it isn't. Um, there's also different different storytelling you do with with something we're going to talk about in our next section. But before we go to there, let's ask you, the audience. You have been doing process mining here and there, I'm assuming. What information did you find from your process mining efforts? What was in your mining analyses? How did that information direct further investigation through iterative analysis and potential action to address some of the concerns raised through your first layer of process mining analysis. We'll leave you for a moment and come back with our final section, detailed process analysis. The wind will blow, but it's just changing. It's just changing. And welcome back to the last segment of this show. And this is obviously a little bit different than the other ones because we have a full content segment here. Uh, so please don't hang up. Stay on the <laughs> line. You know, and, and They're already to, gone, Roland. We, we can't know, get them back. I know. <laughs> I will see it in our statistics on Spotify. I know. Um, but hey, the point is, uh, what did we talk? We spoke about the approach. Um, in the second segment, we spoke about a high-level analysis, right? Which I'm fully aware that were a lot of bullet points, and I put them in the show notes. This yeah. in this segment, we're going to talk about more detailed process analysis. So the objective is to get to not only more details, but actually to the root cause of uh, the problems that we see, right? And they obviously work in conjunctions with uh, all the other stuff that we just spoke about. So JM, kick us off with with the first thing that you. Uh, typically use when you do more detailed analysis on your process? That's a great question. It talks to something that I am I, I'm in love with, I'm obsessed with. It's something that I think about all the time, which is active, dynamic, filtering. Oh, filters, my friend. Filters, filters, filters. They are the key to getting to the heart of your challenges. Filters rely primarily, well, I'll say primarily on dimensions. However, there's a few different types of filters that I really enjoy. So one of those filters that is that I think is really good is dimensional filters that allow you to take those, those characteristics, those filterable characteristics, and hone in on what characteristics may be relevant for you. Good example, you want to analyze a process, and that process has, let's say, many different departments that do it different ways. But what you want to do 
is get your department's data and use that to be able to drive forward analysis that you can act on. You also want to choose different filters that are interesting for you based off of characteristics you find in your data. Good example, I worked with a client recently that was talking about whether or not invoice was, or invoices had matched on its first contact with the with the, um, the shipment. So the shipment invoice is at a first time match, right? Well, why don't we just filter all of our data by the answer is no, it didn't match. So now we are only looking at our problem characteristics and that's really handy for me to be able to start looking at what matters to me right now. So that's that's the d dimensional filters because those dimensional filters, once again, are incredibly handy for getting me to the data I need to know right now without having to sort of wade through a large set of things. It Yeah, it also has some drawbacks, you know. And, sure. And I think that is, uh, I think, an, an inherent problem in all the tools, you know. It's either one-dimensional or two-dimensional analysis, you know. Show yeah. me the, whatever, case duration by region and by product line. Right? Yeah. And, and then you have a whatever a bar chart or whatever in there. But how do I add my third dimension or my fourth or my fifth? Yeah. Right? So that that's a challenge, right? And, well, you also want to layer filters, right? Like yeah. that's the, if you have one filter at a time, what you're missing is the interaction between characteristics, right? A good example is what if you had not first time match in, in the, a certain region with this particular priority from this particular supplier? Mm -hmm. Now we can start to see like, hey, how often does this end in this way? Now I'm starting to see a set of characteristics. And we're going to later on talk about root cause mining um, a little bit. But that's where, that's where those root cause stack up to provide a process characteristic that highlights where issues truly are. Yeah, but I think that the key takeaway is uh, you should save those filters. Right? Yes. And you should come up with a naming scheme for your filters. Because oh, for sure. if you do that for weeks... At end, you know, three weeks later, you don't recall this, you know. So have a notepad, uh, not on the on your bedside, but have a notepad <laughs> on your desk, you know, and and note down how you use those filters and and what the naming conventions were, because when you go back to your client and you show them that stuff, you obviously don't want to fiddle with your twenty filters or hundred filters that you have saved, and you don't know what you what the story is that you want to talk. Right. That filters, so filters can also work on a couple of different other dimensions I want to talk about. I want to say dimensions, a couple of other different characteristics that I want to talk about. So I've been talking about field filters that are mostly about dimensions or about measures and above or below or using math a little bit on those. We can also talk about whether or not you do something. So you think about activity filters. Does it pass through a certain case or case your case to pass through a certain step? So mm -hmm. for instance, if you don't want to reject step. Okay, so I want to find all the cases that do pass through. That's a that's a behavioral characteristic by step. Or, and here's where things get kind of cool, you can also filter things, if your tool allows for it, based off of flow. So what behavior pattern of connections is it going through that I don't want to see? So it's directly followed by a good example. Of that is I don't want to have a request directly followed by a receipt. Mm -hmm. Where where was the approval? Mm -hmm. Similarly, I don't want to have a exception process eventually followed by a rejection. If I've already agreed to do an exception, it shouldn't get a rejection. Show me all those places where that happened. These are really cool filters that will help me narrow this down and find out where I should investigate further. But Roland, that's filtering, right? Just the last word on this. Here you need to talk with a 20, 30 year veteran in your process. Yes, right, consult because your experts. you as you as the consultant or you as the newbie analyst, you just don't know that, you know. And and those guys can give you exactly those hints that you need to look like a rock star. Oh yeah, well, context is everything, right? Yeah. We talk about that every day. Yep. So so maybe the next thing that you want to look at is is and, and JM mentioned it earlier is variance. You know, so just for those three people who listen to the podcast who haven't heard it, a variant is basically a different walkthrough through the process maze, if you will. Right. So if you have a sequence A, B, C, and D, that's one variance. Uh, if you have a sequence A, C, B, and D. That's a second one, and that the process mining tools will give you exactly those different variations yes. in there. What you want to look for, obviously, is you use them for filter creation, as JM said it, so check table stakes. Sure. Uh, but what you want to look for is 
um, this is a good measure of how controlled your process is. Oh, because yeah. I would, I would expect that uh, 80% of all cases, your percentage might vary, should be covered by maybe the first five or 10 variants. Right, that would uh, would be a good controlled process, and um, what you see is typically obviously a hockey stick graph when you get this printed out. Right, uh, what you can then do, JM alluded to it, if you don't have a reference model, you can take that eighty twenty process and export it into your modeling repository and and iterate on this and create a reference process how work should be done. And, and, and what would you call that reference process, Roland? It might be your uh, what baseline. Oh. What's oh, your baseline? <laughs> dot com. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, I'm not kidding. Go there, please. Yeah. <laughs> no, see, see, I got just got a, a blank here. You know, and I should know right. I pay for the domain. Damn, it's true. <laughs> so the 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 other things that you could see is on on variants is obviously use them for further analysis, right? On the dimensions, metrics, as we spoke about. But you want to see other patterns, misbehavior. Uh, you want to use it for to increase standardization. We mentioned that before, maybe with the help of automation. And, and obviously, you also want to update your policies, right? And you want to yes. communicate that users should adhere to them, you know, especially Ooh. if you're in a regulated industry, you know, banking, uh, pharma, whatever, right? You want to make sure that you're, that you're kosher, which brings me JM to the next point. I know the big one conformance. Here you go. Yeah. So there's a couple of things about this. So I, I, I want to talk about conformance in two ways because conformance means to me both compliance to a reference process and compliance to rules. We talked a little bit about rules before, but I'll, I'll talk about it in, this in, in two ways. So conformance means you have a reference process on how you expected the process to work, the set of acceptable patterns on the flow of your process model. When your process mining data shows you something different, you can mark it as a non-conformant process and highlight where that conformance fails. Generally, it fails in a few different ways. Started in the wrong place, ended in the wrong place, did things we didn't expect, didn't do things we did expect and did stuff out of order. That's a basic conformance. You can get a general number of how closely your process executed to expectations. Now, remember, that does rely on your business model being, you know, incorporating all the different variations into it that you will consider acceptable. But it is a great understanding whether or not it complied to your requirements for, for instance, regulatory or like ISO obligations. Yeah, the way how I, I like to label this check, you know, are all the steps there and are they in the right sequence and all this. I like to call that the structural conformance. Yes. But there's also another conformance that you might want to check, JM, don't you? Yeah, it is SLA conformance. So did we meet our targets? And this is where we start to take our, um, and this goes into the next piece a little bit as well, which is SLA and business rule conformance. I don't want to conflate the two because they are different on how they work, but they are both checking against an expectation. SLA conformance is a, a metric expectation and business rule analysis often falls into a dimensional uh, expectation. So, so a metric expectation is I've calculated the time you didn't deliver in 24 hours on average. In fact, 70% of your cases were over 20, 24 hours. Welcome to Pain Town. You're going to be paying back a lot of these broken SLAs. I'm sure you have contractual implications to that. Business rule analysis as a dimensional analysis are things like segregation of duty. So the dimension of user that I that I saw in my request is the same dimension user that I saw as my approver. Wait, Roland, did you just go in and approve your own expense report? Yes, you did. And that's a segregation of duty. Isn't that what I'm supposed to? How do I get all my new toys here? Learning and development, Roland. Learning and development. We're going to help teach oh, you how dang. to do this better. And yeah. honestly, people worry about interaction analysis. I 
I don't want to get too much into that because there's some ethical questions about that, particularly when you see like the username of the person who did it. But this is about learning and development, improving your workforce by helping educate them on better processes. And this is the way to emerge that. And, so and, those are conformance checks that we might put in place. Yeah, and, and maybe maybe to put a bow on the business rule part of it, behind yep. it there's, there's another aspect on it. And, and at least in our tool, it's that way. We're using business rules also to, de to determine what we call an end of case rule, which sounds super scientific but at the end of the day you just basically have one rule that says yep a process is counted as complete if it has one of those end activities yeah right and what it does is in the background once you've defined it you got another filter that says uh cases in progress right so you can filter to say okay which are which in these data sets are completed and which ones aren't right so business rules also can be used for those mundane things i agree yeah, the next thing that you want to look at is, and, and I don't want to go too much into details, is you look at your custom dimensions or metric analysis, right? So you want to go down into the nitty gritty rabbit hole of, oh, this region stinks if this combination of that <laughs> with, with a third thing comes in. We spoke about this, right? So yeah. you might drill down into this. Um, th the next one, I think, is something that I've just seen uh, ish. Uh, out of the box with one vendor, which which I like, but not mm, I don't know. So you could do something like a role analysis. Right? You could, so yeah. One thing that I that I that I like to do is, um, if the data set doesn't have it, is to cluster the users into certain roles. So it's another yeah. uh, conversation with the client. But then I like to take my data set as part of the analysis, you know, and I replace the activities with those roles. Right. Ooh, and, and have the graph and I just upload it into another project and I have the graph de being displayed. Uh, role A talks to role B and then it goes back to role C and from role C it goes back to A and then A talks to D and, and whatnot. So you get another spaghetti diagram, but you can do obviously the same analysis that you had before. You know, you can see who's interacting with whom, frequencies, durations, you know, you look at whatever the, the nearby tasks, you know, I don't want this role to talk to that role that JM just said before. You could use yeah. the, the bottleneck visualizations, you know, that could be an input. If you go further down the route, you know, you do some simulation of your future state where that could be an input, right? It could uh, be for this, right? So you do basically a case analysis, quote unquote, by role, which is uh, an interesting exercise. Actually, a I, I, fun, fun story. I actually did the very similar thing, but by system. Oh, yeah. Um, so you I, could so, do the, the same. I used yeah, the tool yeah. like, oh, I, I used our tool to try and figure out what the um, the interfaces were between systems because I could see subsequent steps that were happening in systems and what data mm -hmm. needed to pass across those. So it's sort of a data flow analysis mm -hmm. as an overlay to a process mining, mining analysis. These are cool tools that you can use to bring in different domains and also, remember, different stakeholders. Because they'll yeah. care about different things. And the more people you have as part of the community, the more you are likely to get good information, good context, and also, also a great method for collaborative decision making. Yep. And then we have two more topics that we want to talk about. And, and one, obviously, is uh, the case analysis. Right? Yeah. We all spoke about the high-level process, the cases and whatnot, uh, which is an aggregated form. You obviously want to drill down into... Uh, your individual cases. And typically you can obviously when you're in a case explorer view or however you want to call it, you can filter there. Same thing, you know, so you can filter cases that don't meet your expectations. You know, show me all cases that take longer than a week, a month, a year, you know, to filter it down. But then you can look at the details of, of each case, you know, um, within that, that group there. Um, some tools do have some nice visualization in there, showing things in a Gantt chart format, for example, because then you get the time aspect being shown on a timeline uh, versus the abstract number. But at the end, it's just getting more details to the, the high level thing that you've noticed in your higher level analysis. You know, something sticks out. Yeah. And... Then I, I, the next thing I want to talk about, um, which I think is a, an interesting topic, and it, it ties into something that we talked about with, with Silco, which is prediction. Mm -hmm. And prediction happens in a couple of different ways. Um, there are some tools in the marketplace that will offer predictive analysis based on pro process mining. There are some tools 
in the marketplace that have simulation that, that are built into them as, as, a, as a part of the platform. And there are some that export or integrate with other simulation tools. Once again, referring back to our previous episode where we talked about the process simulation. This is how you can take the information you've gotten from this process mining to establish the characteristics of a simulation model that you might need to understand what would happen in different business scenarios. And I'll give you one of those as an example. We use simulation as a way to future-proof processes. So you take your process mining data, you iterate on that, maybe you do some improvement on your process. You've decided on what your steady state is, is and you mine that out, and you get some good data on how it, how it behaves. That becomes your data input for a simulation, and then you scale up the demand characteristic. So you say, this, this process used to be done 500 times a day, and now it's going to be done 5,000 times a day. Mm-hmm. Where will it break first? And let's predict some business outcomes that we would achieve or not achieve with our current staffing, resourcing, with the way in which it's engineered. Can this process hold under different circumstances? So some things is, is parameter variation by like saying, oh, I, I'm you know, 500 to 5,000 cases. Some is parameter variation on business rules. So, hey, currently invoices are, um, if their invoice is above 1,000 euros, we make you have a personal touch. Tomorrow, it's going to be, if the invoice is above 10,000 euros, I'm going to have to have a personal touch. Can it? What's going to happen? How many cases are going to no longer require interaction? Both are good. They lead to sort of different choices, one being like business rules redefinition, one being, being actual potential re-engineering or re-automation. But that predictive analysis gives you tools you'll need to evolve. That's useful. Yeah, I agree. So simulation is a complete different topic. I agree it with is. everything that you just said. You know, yes, there should be a connectivity between uh, your process mining tool, your process repository, and your simulation tool. Correct. Right. So uh, don't skip out the middle part. Um, but um, and I'm, I'm happy to have a process mining tool that does the prediction in the tool <laughs> because that makes things a little bit easier because what you can do now is within the tool, you obviously can filter by cases that are in progress. So you take out the noise right, of those completed things where you know how it ended. And then you can do your analysis and say, hey, show me this only for this region or for whatever, whatever metric you, you came up with. The, the benefit of that is if the tool does it in, uh, there as well, and I know that, that the tool that you sell, JM, and the one that we sell here uh, do the same, you can do alerting, right? And if your tool does the prediction, you can also alert things on that might happen in the future, right? So that's that's a nice feature to have to say, oh, yeah, this container doesn't come from China in the right time because that vendor is so unreliable and, and whatnot. So you could have some automated uh, alerts and notifications on this. So that brings yeah. us, Jam, to the to the end of the, the analysis. But there's also two things that I think we should talk about um, from a project approach. Right? It's, it's true. And I do want to add one more because you just mentioned it from mm-hmm. like an operational approach. So mm-hmm. you, why Hopefully. don't you start with the project? Actually, I'll start with the operational, then you will go with the project approach. The operational approach is you did mention alerts and notifications. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot, there are process mining tools out there. We all know them who have execution systems or who have insight to action modules or who have mm-hmm. connections into to hook into real transactional systems. And process mining, I got I, I can't stress this enough is not a real-time notification tool. Not really supposed to be that. It's a historical look back. Now, the historical can be really recent. That's fine. But it isn't necessarily supposed to be a real-time analysis tool with next, next best action for microtransaction. That is not really what it's for. However, if, you, if your process mining tool identifies patterns or behaviors that you don't like, Some tools will allow you to send out notifications, alerts, or even trigger transactions and actions in other systems that will allow those systems to react to the the process mining discoveries. I'll give you a good example. I worked with a client, actually, we both worked with this client, who who had a a system that was, uh, had contract renewals. And when the process mining system they had detected that a contract renewal was coming up, but in the process, it hadn't yet reached the step of creating a renewal contract Mm -hmm. itself. 
And it was less than 30 days. The, t- the time had, had elapsed. It was less than 30 days until the renewal date. It would automatically, automatically go into its contract management system, create a new renewal contract, notify the renewals manager that a contract had not been created, automatically assigning them so they can delegate it to somebody in their team. Mm-hmm. That's not a terrible usage. It's not a full replacement of automation. You really should probably have automated that better or had better business practices, but it can be a fail safer stopgap or an alert tool when you see negative uh, process patterns that you would like to address. That's an operational outcome. Yeah, I think this is this is interesting when, to your point, what you mentioned before, when you, when you see the before and after, right? Because it adds another layer uh, on on your how you improve your execution you know you don't redesign the whole process you just make the existing one less bad right yeah i think that that helps there but to to come back to the to the, to the last two points that i here uh, want to talk about here is uh one is obviously you did all that analysis right now you know you, yeah. you scribbled your notebook full of findings you built glorious dashboards and, and whatnot but i think that the analysis is just one part of the game Right, you turn data into information that's done by the tool, and your analysis transforms it into knowledge. So you should have some findings, you know, like what are this process out of control or whatever you have. Right. You typically show that in dashboards or other visualizations, right? Like in a PowerPoint or whatever you have. But I think when you think about the six-step process that we spoke about in the first half hour, you want to have the identification of your value opportunities as the core desired outcome. And this is something that you typically don't see in your process mining tool, because that means you will have to turn on your brain. You will have to come up with ideas, how to fix it. Uh, You will have to have a look in your repository to see if there are dependencies that might kill your wonderful ideas. You know, just replacing that, that ERP system with something else in uh, your future set process doesn't help if the ERP system is used in 250 other processes, right? <laughs> so you don't save it down. So typically think about it that you will have some form of PowerPoint or report or something that's a takeaway of that project. Yeah. And when you do that, you better articulate this and display that in a way that management can make decisions. Oh, yes. you have three options. You know, A, B, or C, you know, do nothing, do even less or do what I recommend, right? <laughs> and then you, you obviously want them to to put them in, uh, obviously, your recommendation, right? And now we open a complete different can of worms, how to do data visualization and, and all that stuff that I don't want to go down in this podcast. Well, all right. I think this is a great opportunity to cap it off. We've talked a lot about this. From our high-level you know, approach to process mining, then a high-level uh, process mining analysis, and then down to the detailed process analysis where you're looking to make a meaningful change using data as a shepherd. I like to call it evidence-based decision-making in process re-engineering. So hopefully you've seen some things, maybe you do today, validating your approach to process mining. Hopefully you've seen some things that maybe you don't do. Learning and growing on hate. Maybe you do things we haven't thought of. This is a great chance to mention the website. So whatsyourbaseline.com slash podcast is a really great place for you to go and see all of our different episodes. Whatsyourbaseline.com slash episode 57 for this one specifically. But you can connect with us by LinkedIn. You can leave us ratings and reviews. You can leave us a voice message. Let us know what you think because we know how many process mining professionals there are out there who really care about this discipline and have really good ideas to share. So get in touch. And thank you so much for coming with us on this ride. We're really enjoying our wonderful audience and the ability to share some of our thought leadership and learn from our community. But until we speak again, friends, I've been J.M. Erlinson. And my name is Roland Volt. And we will see you in the next one.